inverse design. Um, so I'll I'll uh, review um, what inverse design is, why it's potentially so powerful, and what are the challenges to realizing it, uh, as well as some uh, recent advances in this area uh, that might inspire future work and hopefully move us as a community closer to this objective. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on crystalline materials because this is my area of specialty, although there are other um, let's say researchers and, and uh, very good research being done in inorganic, in inorganic materials. So small molecules, polymers, and peptides somewhere in between the two. And I'm going to use the term <clears throat> general inverse design uh, instead of specialized inverse design to denote that we're exploring the entire periodic table and all 230 three-dimensional space groups as opposed to one specific narrow uh, region of, of um, composition space. So uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge several people, including Army, who uh, contributed to the early parts of this work. Uh, it's a much broader team, um, several of them on Zoom during the pandemic and then uh, back in, in the lab recently. Um, so the goal of inverse design is the following. You give me a set of properties. You say I'd like a material with this band gap, with this stability, with this thermal conductivity. You give a list of properties. And I give you a material with surgical precision. I'm able to use an algorithm uh, with the inputs being the properties and the output being uh, the material. Um, I'm going to define material loosely at the beginning here. It might be a stoichiometry. It might be a stoichiometry plus a crystal structure. Uh, but at the moment, this is uh, broadly framed, the goal of inverse design. And uh, Alex, I, I'm, I'm not the first person to come up with this idea. There are, there's a rich literature out there, and I would refer you to a review paper by Alex Zunger uh, in Nature Review Chemistry in 2018, where uh, Alex laid out the premise of inverse design after benefiting from uh, an EFRC, an, an Energy Frontier Research Center, uh, five years of funding from the Department of Energy, where he co-led a center uh, in the United States focused on inverse design. And so this was the culmination of a, of a lot of research into this topic. And the direct design, the way that we are used to performing materials research is you start with a sieve file of a, of a material, and then you compute its properties, right? You go in this direction here. Um, so you start with a, a list of atomic positions and uh, atomic character and fractional occupancy uh, in the case of alloys. And then you, you use that, that structural information, that, that compositional information to compute a set of uh, functions. This would be, say, band gap. Um, if you have a very advanced simulator, your stability or thermal conductivity and so on. And, and the inverse design is, is going in the opposite direction, right? It's solving the inverse problem. Um, and it's challenging for the following three reasons. So challenge number one is that technological applications of interest often contain conflicting or contradicting attributes. I'll give you an example. Um, a thermoelectric material with a high ZT uh, mandates a, a large electrical conductivity and a small thermal conductivity. And usually in materials, these two properties scale together. So you increase one, you increase the other. And you have to get around, you have to break that, that uh, coincidence uh, using um, uh, uh, phonon band engineering, for example, in the material. And so it becomes challenging to embed that kind of information in an algorithm, especially when the physics is rare. Uh, and we'll get to that in the, in, in the next one. Um, the second big challenge is that many materials representations are not invertible, meaning you can put it into an algorithm and compress information. But trying to get the information back out of the algorithm, uh, think of a SIF file, for example, the SIF file will have a different number of rows depending on the number of atoms in the unit cell. Um, so there isn't a standardized input file format for the algorithm, and this is usually a big problem. Um, so coming up with an invertible crystallographic representation that satisfies general inverse design is a major challenge. And challenge number three, is that many of the compounds that are predicted by inverse design algorithms turn out not to be stable. So finding materials that are uh, maybe a hypernym of stability is synthesizability, right? Finding materials that are synthesizable using uh, commonly accessible uh, reaction conditions on, on planet Earth uh, can be a challenge. 
maybe uh, in some other uh, temperature pressure gas partial pressure regime uh, these compounds are, are synthesizable but not here so challenges one two and three will bear in mind uh, rare and contradicting attributes number one invertible crystallographic representation and stability so just to recap Rare and contradicting at attributes from a machine learning language is basically referring to class imbalance. Uh, you have um, a rare set of, of good candidates that you're trying to learn from and a large number of bad candidates uh, for a given application, typically. Um, invertibility, uh, from a machine learning perspective, uh, it, it has to do with inputs, zero padding, extracting information. And uh, stability is, is what we typically refer to as refinements in proteomics, um, being able to remove or, or shed compounds that are prune the compounds that are not um, going to be uh, worthwhile. And so um, this is uh, shown here on this slide. Just to frame the magnitude of the problem, when we start with a materials innovation challenge, we typically have order 10 to the 10 stoichiometric crystalline materials to choose from. This is an estimate. It's not known how many compounds are actually out there. Uh, this estimate came from work by Dan Davies, uh, Keith, uh, and, and Aaron Walsh, uh, 2016 uh, computational chemistry, I believe. I can I can forward you the reference if you uh, ask ARMY and, and are very keen to, to learn. I can, I can send this to you. But order 10 to the 10 inorganic stoichiometric crystalline uh, compounds. And this is much too large to scan experimentally. So even if you have a super uh, experimental high throughput tool that is able to scan a million materials an hour, um, you're still uh, four orders of magnitude away from being able to, uh, to find that material by brute force. And, um, and, and the down selection is, is typically done by an inverse design algorithm a database search or some other uh, type of approach that will get you down to a, a reasonable number that can be experimentally tested. Here, a thousand samples is already quite aggressive. So you need um, you need to have a, a good, uh, true positive uh, uh, rate in order to, to find the compounds that you're actually looking for uh, down here. You also need to be able to consider the fact that 10 to the 10 is a, a theoretical upper, uh, upper bound for the total number of stoichiometric inorganic materials. And our current materials databases have order 10 to the five compounds inside of them, 10 to the five, 10 to the sixth. And so there's, um, there's the need to generate a lot of these compounds um, um, that, that would, that would uh, satisfy the set up here. So you could either uh, consider a generative design algorithm that would create a bunch of compounds and, and filter them out uh, based on, on um, stability and synthesizability and the properties you're looking for, or a true inverse design algorithm that trains on the basis of the 10 to the five known compounds, learns the patterns, and then is able to extrapolate from there to other unknown compounds that are not yet uh, reported in literature. So this is the, the challenge. I, I hope I framed it from a a dual point of view, two sides of the table. One is machine learning, the other material science. And, um, and now we get to go into some of the fun stuff, which are the, uh, the work and results that lead to this point. So I wanted to draw a contrast between generative design and inverse design. We, because of the, the prominence of chat GPT, we tend to use generative design as a catch-all phrase. There is a a difference in my mind between these two in materials research, and I wanted to highlight that specifically using a couple of examples. So um, let's take an early example from our lab uh, 10 years ago at this point, where we used generative design for silicon solar cell manufacturing. And the goal was to take a time temperature profile. Um, so on the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is temperature here. And uh, what you're seeing is uh, cooling down from crystallization. And then there's a step called phosphorus diffusion that creates the junction that separates charges in a solar cell and then cooling down from there. And below, you can see the evolution of the defects inside of the bulk of the solar cell. We modeled this using a simulator. Uh, David Fenning, who did this work, is now a professor at UCSD. And we extracted carrier, we estimated the um, carrier lifetime. This is a, a parameter of merit of electronic quality of the material. 
How long does a photoexcited carrier remain in an excited state as it tries to move through the solar cell? You know, it gets excited by sunlight and then it has to move through the solar cell to be collected at the front contact. How does that carrier lifetime translate to solar cell efficiency? So again, it's defects, lifetime, efficiency. And this simulation tool we called I2E because it went from impurities to efficiency, um, I2E. And we would, be, we would run this in a generative mode uh, using a genetic algorithm. So one initial time temperature profile that seeded the process would then be mutated in various forms. And the fitness of each um, time temperature profile in Gen 2 would be evaluated. The least fit would be removed. And then the next generation would be spawned from the previous fittest uh, time temperature profiles. And this process would continue um, many steps until finally you saw an improvement of the carrier lifetime. Again, that parameter of merit that defines electronic material quality is improving um, generation upon generation as well, the distribution tightening um, as the algorithm uh, gets corralled into uh, an optimum. And so this uh, is, is visualized here as a time temperature profile. Keep your solar cells hot, then cool them down, not in a step function, but with a bit of a slope to get the metals to precipitate out in the right places. Um, that was the key learning from here. And this is an example of a generative design approach to improve not materials in that case. In this case, it's the process, a uh, phosphorus diffusion process. Um, this was used in, in fact, many companies to improve their uh, solar cell efficiencies and probably is embedded in solar panels on roofs um, in various places. Um, free, free code that was available using a, a server in our lab at the time. Um, this was before uh, GitHub became massively popular in the material science field. And um, we did similar approaches for solar power desalination systems, not just the materials and solar cells and cells, but the entire systems. How do you optimize uh, photovoltaics, water storage, electricity storage, and um, electrodialysis. This unit here on the lower left is what's used to purify the brackish water when you have salinity on the order of 100 parts per million. Uh, let's say you're pulling water from an aquifer 100 kilometers inland from the ocean, and you have the water from the aquifer, the rainwater mixing with the ocean water, the salinity is around 100 ppm. Uh, reverse osmosis is not as energy efficient as electrodialysis, and you want to design a system that uses this constellation of bits and pieces. A very similar approach here. You just represent everything um, as a mathematical model and run an optimization, in this case, particle swarm optimization, generate a whole bunch of theoretical hypothetical systems, and then down select to the ones that are uh, the best performing. And in this case, you can see uh, it was system cost that we were trying to optimize for. And we had about a 40% reduction of system cost relative to our baseline system that we designed initially, and it was um, it was tested and and um, and is running in in Chiluru, India, a small uh, town um, in in rural India. And you've seen examples of of AutoCAD Fusion three hundred and sixty and and others showing nice generative design approaches. The reason I wanted to uh, dwell a bit on generative design is because there is some potential using this. If you can accurately simulate interatomic potentials, meaning the potential energy landscape between atoms, um, thus essentially uh, replacing DFT first principles calculations with a machine learned um, uh, potential instead, and, and there are variants, uh, energies, forces, and so on, um, each with their own advantages and disadvantages, you might from there, then launch into generating a whole bunch of new compounds, right? Um, you, would, you would generate hypothetical compounds, test their stability, and populate what is called a synthetic database. This is a, a database of make-believe materials using what is uh, uh, an interatomic potential trained on known materials. And then you apply a series of filters. So this is the approach that people like Shui Pingong are trying to take right now. In fact, this was the approach that DeepMind took. Once DeepMind uh, refined the distance parameter for protein folding, uh, and I have to give credit to Columbia for inventing that approach, and then Google Applied Sciences, and then finally DeepMind uh, for, for bringing it to fruition within the, the CAS protein folding competition. Um, what they did, once they had a good algorithm to predict structure, is they ran that algorithm in a generative mode 
And from a training set of a few hundred thousand proteins, they generated 200 million synthetic proteins. They had confidence that their algorithm was not spitting out junk, that it was spitting out uh, good, uh, reasonable uh, proteins that could be made. And then they created a, a database, put those, uploaded those 200 million compounds and made it available for people who are doing drug discovery. So then you can brute force screen that database of synthetic compounds. So this is a valid approach. Uh, people are trying to reproduce this for material science. I should note Shui Pingong from UCSD is, is pushing this hard. And this is a, a very promising direction. Um, if, it, if, if the uh, interatomic potentials prove to be accurate enough to be able to predict um, uh, high quality materials, I would say materials that have a reasonable chance of being made, uh, then this approach will bear fruit. So um, that's a, a generative design approach. The challenge with that line of research right now is really getting uh, a generalized interatomic potential that's able to uh, capture uh, interatomic interactions uh, across the entire periodic table and in all space groups. So I'm going to skip over the next set of, of um, topics. This is more to do with database search. It's not today's um, uh, topic of conversation. Uh, we've, we've done work searching existing databases, but they're, they're rather limited. So I'm going to skip over this portion and then get toward the very end where we talk more about inverse design again. Um, here we go. Generative design, search chemical space, yes. So um, let's, let's start getting into uh, the question of, uh, of generative, of, of inverse design, whether or not there are new materials out there to be made, right? So some people say, oh, why are you doing this work? There are no new materials. I did want to highlight some work that um, ARMY and, and Xi Jing were involved in, actually Xi Jing led, in this case it was in 2019. Um, the, uh, we, we have a, a platform at MIT called Soul Train, which was moderately high throughput materials exploration, about one material every five minutes, based on thin film synthesis up here on the upper left-hand corner. And then uh, a loop that was driven by the output data, either optical or structural, uh, mostly. And uh, what we did in, in that particular study in 2019 is we mixed and matched different um, anions and cations, different Lego building blocks, elemental and molecular building blocks of a perovskite crystal structure. Right? So this is a, a, a cubic crystal structure with three different sites, uh, the A site, the B site, those are both cations, and the X site, the anion, so A, B, X, three. And we mixed these the ratios of these different elements, and some of them could not fit into a traditional ABX3 cubic perovskite structure. They formed other phases, other stoichiometries, but we can consider them in a study as well. So by mixing the precursors in different combinations and then uh, driving them through this, this uh, materials factory, if you will, we tested 75, sorry, uh, 96 different compositions, 75 of which were successfully grown. Each composition was attempted mm, uh, order eight times on average. And out of that came a couple of new materials that hadn't been reported previously. Um, this here is, a, is, is one uh, stoichiometric material, and this is an alloy series um, that had not previously been reported. These other compounds up at the top, these four, um, had been made in bulk crystals but never in thin film form before. And, and this is not a terribly high throughput system either. In two months, we were able to get through a order 100 uh, different compositions, and yet two new materials came out of it. To put this in broader terms, this is a, a micro example, to put it in macro terms, if you look at the inorganic crystal structure database, you'll see that the number of entries doubles roughly every 10 years. So the inorganic crystal structure database is um, one of the most reputable repositories for crystal structures. So if somebody comes up with a new compound, for example, this one, uh, we run off and we do powder diffraction on it, and then we upload that information to the ICSD for review. And if it passes review, then it gets entered into the database. And it's a fairly rigorous bar um, that concerns both stoichiometry and structure with powder diffraction. So the number of known compounds in the ICSD is doubling every 10 years, indicating that we're still an exponential growth of 
uh, new materials. And so I think there is a lot of room at the top. We're not done yet. So um, let's talk a bit about contradicting attributes and about rarity and, and encoding information into an algorithm. So I'll, I'll dwell for the next couple of minutes on a particular algorithm that we've developed in our lab called FTCP, Fourier Transform Crystal Structures. Not because we think it's the best algorithm. In fact, I, I have my doubts. I, I don't think at this point one can claim any one approach is significantly better than the other because they're all falling short still. But more to highlight the challenges of developing an inverse design algorithm. So let me uh, hop over these slides here. These are mostly to do with polymer and, and nanoparticle synthesis and, and design, um, brute forcing uh, the, the learning of, of a regressor to be able to perform inverse design. So learning structure property relationships and then uh, driving it in the inverse direction. So we'll skip over that for now. And instead I'll, I'll talk about an algorithm called uh, FTCP, Fourier Transform Crystal Structure, uh, Crystal Properties, excuse me, where um, we, we, what we're trying to do here is uh, solve the invertibility challenge, right? We want to develop a materials representation that is invertible and that we can go from a property to a structure. So this is a, a type of algorithm called variational autoencoder. And I do have to give credit to Rafa Gomez Bombarelli and Alana Spuruguzic and colleagues for coming up with this idea and applying it first to small molecules about a decade ago. Um, what, we, what we did, uh, which was novel, was try to use this type of approach um, for inorganic materials and embed information not only in the real space uh, uh, as, as we're used to in a SIP file, for example, uh, the atomic coordinates, but also the uh, certain critical inverse space uh, properties, right? So the, uh, the fact that we have a crystal uh, means that there is a a, a, a defined representation in Fourier space. And so we're trying to extract that information as well. And the ultimate goal is to uh, produce new materials based on user-defined target properties. Um, what we're doing is we're organizing um, the so-called latent space here. This is a compressed version of the inputs. Um, I'll, get to the, uh, I'll get to all of these little blocks in more detail in a minute, but just to orient yourself in the big picture. Um, the latent space is organized by property. Right. So if you're interested in band gap stability and thermal conductivity, then in dimension number one of latent space, you might have an, or, an ordering of band gap. In dimension number two of latent space, it might be ordered according to stability. And that's all coming from a, a target learning branch coming in from the side here. So what's interesting from a machine learning and material science point of view is how do you represent a material like gallium arsenide into a machine learning algorithm? to perform inverse design. And there's a bunch of, of information, right? There's the elements that themselves, the lattice matrix that gives you an idea of lattice sizes, the site coordinate matrix, right? And then the site occupancy matrix, which would give you an idea of alloying, right? So site occupancy, if it's one, it means that there is a 100% probability of gallium always occupying that site. If there is a, uh, 0.5, it would mean that it, you have mixed occupancy, 50-50. And then what you often see in inverse design algorithms are element property matrices. Right? These are um, fudge factors. I have to be very clear with you. Um, you're embedding element-specific information like electronegativity and uh, on into the, the materials representation. So you're trying to take parameters out of the CRC handbook of materials and stuff them into the matrix. Um, where you start running into trouble are parameters that depend on ionization state. So for example, atomic radius. The atomic radius of sodium, when it's in its neutral state or its plus one state, when you strip away that S electron and, and strip it down to the P electrons, the atomic radius changes by almost 50%. Right? And, you, you have difficulty coming up with one number to put into this matrix. Uh, think of something close, you know, you, you usually run into problems right at the edges of um, uh, electron orbitals. So for example, copper, which is a 3D10, if I remember correctly, um, run into a lot of troubles because its ionization state is not a, a, a discrete number in some cases, it's fractional, right? So, um, 
th this this is just to highlight some of the challenges and in reciprocal space features a lot of zero padding a lot of zero padding and especially here also in the um, site coordinate matrix a lot of zero padding so you could almost think of this as a bitmap representation of a material going in an algorithm and then um, the algorithm is is compressing that information um, you have to deal with training imbalance so taking a step back training the algorithm using say materials project this is a view of materials project as a function of atomic number on the y-axis and space groups so on the y-axis you have chemistry on the x-axis you have structure and notice there's a lot of blank space in here not necessarily because those compounds don't exist but maybe because research grants didn't focus on those areas, they were more interested in lithium ion batteries. And so you have the lithium aluminum phase diagram uh, very well calculated, but a big gap over there. So stability, um, how do we deal with that? Well, um, the, we, 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 we have a solution for invertibility. Um, the algorithm, a variational autoencoder can invert that FTCP representation. Um, but how do we weed out the junk compounds, the ones that aren't synthesizable? Um, there, is, uh, there are various forms of, of, of weeding out compounds. You could apply a, a, a machine-learned energy above hull filter uh, to try to estimate the energy above hull and weed out those compounds that have, say, 100 MeV per atom above hull. You could perform DFT on every single one if you have a high-throughput DFT simulation. You could try to use a um, something like the interatomic potential calculator that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation to do uh, energy relaxation. But whatever approach you use, oh, oh, lastly, this is the most fun one. You could use an ICSD representation. Let me explain what that is. So um, you can code every single compound in materials project by its cross-reference. Um, uh, by cross-referencing the, the material in materials project with the ICSD. So let's pause for a minute and, and think about that for a minute. Everything in ICSD has been made, right? Somebody had to go there, make the material, take the powder diffraction, do the chemical analysis, upload it to the ICSD database. So those materials were made. In materials project, on the other hand, these compounds here, not every material has been synthesized. There are a lot of unicorn materials inside of materials project. These were fanciful materials that people came up with. They ran the DFT calculation on, and then it entered into the database. The materials project database is based on DFT. So what you can do is you can give every uh, known compound within materials project an ICSD score. If it has been also reported in ICSD, it gets a score of one. If it is not reported in the ICSD, it gets a score of zero. Are there some false positives and false negatives according to this? Yes, because maybe a compound in materials project could be made, but it just never got made yet. And so it was never made, it never put into the ICSD. But we'll leave those concerns aside for a minute and we'll just use a brute force ICSD score. Interestingly, this works pretty well as a predictor of whether or not a compound will be synthesizable. For every generated compound out of the decoder side, you can predict its ICSD score based on pattern recognition of the 100,000 plus compounds that came before it. And it'll produce an ICSD score and tell you whether it's a, it, it, the algorithm thinks it's, it's possible to, to synthesize or not. So in the end of the day, there are many ways to perform structural relaxation or uh, synthesizability prediction. And that's an, an area of ongoing research in, in the field. So we, uh, just to show you some examples of compounds that come out of these types of inverse design algorithms, let's focus on thermoelectrics for the moment. Why thermoelectrics? Well, um, it's one of the more challenging cases, right? Contraindicated properties, thermal and electrical conductivity that point in opposite directions. The fact that you have, in this case, three parameters of merit to optimize for, band gap, formation energy or stability, and ZT, the parameter of merit for a thermoelectric material. So three different materials parameters to simultaneously optimize for. It's a good stress test for the algorithm. And you have a, a state-of-the-art material computed over here. This is the state-of-the-art um, germanium telluride uh, thermoelectric material. This is the 
um, the parameter of merit as a function of carrier concentration in the material and uh, uh, simulate it using Bolt's trap, which is a first principle simulation loosely based on DFT. And uh, on the left hand side here are two designed crystals um, coming out of the inverse design algorithm. Um, they're fanciful. Um, I don't know if they can be made, probably not, uh, but there you can see the state of the art of the field right now, where at least the computed bolt strap ZT along certain crystallographic orientations in the material are um, starting to approximate those of the state of the art materials, right? So at least in the simulation side, we get some validation that we're headed in the right direction. Um, the, the, the parameters of merit are not abysmally low, but this entire field is still challenged um, by producing a lot of junk compounds that aren't synthesizable, right? That won't be made at least on the surface of this planet using available experimental tools to us. So I'm, I'm going to, I think what I'll do is I'll pause here. I know we're behind schedule um, and this is a good break. Yeah. Any other topic would take uh, longer to get into. Um, yeah, Tony, there's a whole bunch could, of other compounds uh, if you to could talk wrap about. up in the we'll next the couple of minutes. Yeah. yeah, we'll go into the Q&A. Um, I did want to mention that our, our lab logo is uh, created by Inverse Design, and there's a, an important story here. Um, this was ChatGPT, a leaf blended with an integrated circuit. These are the outputs. Actually, sorry, this is Hugging Face Crayon. And then I sent these over to a graphics designer who then came up with a logo study. Um, RG is a great guy, uh, does websites and, and logos based in the Philippines, and he came up with our lab logo on the basis of this. So I like using our lab logo as an indication of where this entire field is heading. It really, at the moment, is a collaboration between machines and humans. You cannot do true material science or even lab logo design without the involvement of both. Um, so with that, I'll, I will pause um, and stop sharing and then take your, your questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, hey, thank you, Antonio. I hope you heard the, the claps from the audience through Zoom. Uh, so questions on Zoom, you can see in the chat yourself and uh, probably answer, but then uh, I open the floor here. So Prashval has the mic already. Uh, Gareth, please. Cool, thank you very much, Tony. Gareth Conduit from the University of Cambridge here. So I was really fascinated by your talk. Oh, hello. <laughs> And uh, in particular, the idea of inverse design and what would happen if there were a lot of materials out there that would satisfy the criteria. So I was thinking if I wanted something with a, a strength of at least 100 megapascals, it could be steel, it could be titanium, it could be da 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 da. So I'd be really grateful if you say a few words about how your system would handle that, please. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Gareth, and good to, good to see you. Um, I, I, I wish I were there in person. Um, so I, I think the think uh, the way I think about it, let me let me throw up a, a visual here that's half baked at this point because I'm currently writing a paper on it. Um, so I, I I do think this is an instructive way of looking at the problem. So um, I hope you can see the screen here. I'm going to zoom in, and the yes, way I think about yeah, the way I think about finding material materials in general is um, how common are the properties you're looking for, right? If, if you're in the, let's say one, two sigma, maybe even two and a half sigma, you probably get a pretty good chance of finding those, you know, those, those materials. And so a hundred GPA, I wouldn't yet put into the realm of an exceptional material. I would say there, there are probably a few, many materials that satisfy that. And so the inverse design algorithm, if working well, and if the synthesizability filters are Put in place properly should come up with many qualifying candidates and so then you would feed them into your high throughput simulation tool and you would brute force screen them uh, there might be more sophisticated ways to do materials optimization using needle and haystack style vision optimizers but you could probably just brute force them and find at least one candidate that's satisfied your user-defined properties but the the challenge really becomes when you're looking at three sigma four sigma style properties, right? So a good example would be negative Poisson's ratio, where only, I think it's 0.7, 0.3% of materials project uh, data files have a negative Poisson's ratio. Um, then you're more challenged, right? The, the, you, you, you really suffer from uh, a class in your data set uh, for training. 
So more sophisticated approach is probably using a combined uh, down selection using inverse design up front, but then a materials optimization loop uh, roughly based on BO probably, but a, a more of a needle in a haystack style optimizer. Um, for example, the zombie algorithm that that Alex just just put up on archive. It's a, a question in the chat. Can you can you see that, Tony? Yes. Can we use uh, inverse design for interface designing of optoelectronic devices? Um, I don't see why not. Um, we were just discussing this the other day in the from the perspective of catalysis, and um, I do agree that interface reconstruction and the commensurate property evolution that occurs with interface reconstruction is um, uh, overall a, a big challenge. So the algorithm would have to have enough training data to learn how the surfaces reconstruct and then how the properties change with those reconstructions to be able to then um, compute um, uh, the, the, the properties. And so I would just say you would need to consider that in your training set. The second piece is there are certain properties that are more or less sensitive to defects, right? So if you're trying to compute a majority carrier property, um, like thermal conductivity across that interface, that's one, uh, it, probably an easier type of problem to deal with. If you're dealing with the minority carrier property, like minority carrier lifetime or recombination at that interface, um, that's a much trickier problem. But again, I think one that with the right uh, training data, I mean, it, it, it would expand from a, a six month to maybe a, a two year type of effort to get that to work really well. It's my sense. Okay, we have another question from the audience here. Oh, th thank you for the talk, it was very good. Uh, my question is regarding thermoelectrics. Uh, uh, my question is regarding thermoelectrics. How do you use Bolstrap to get uh, your ZT? Because you can't get lattice thermal conductivity from Bolstrap. Also, if you just have your band structure as your database, then you can't even get relaxation times. So you, you, you're actually losing out on two very important things in the calculation for ZT. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a good question. I think a lot of these um, rely on approximations, right? So um, you have to you have to uh, approximate or or fix certain variables that would otherwise be um, uh, be 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 uh, be varying. Um, why don't I why don't I take that question offline? If you email me, I can give you the code, and then we can go through in more detail um, the approximations made uh, to get to that point. Sounds good. And another question from the audience. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. I was intrigued by the idea of mapping the um, materials project data to the ICSD. Um, and I was wondering if there was a study published where you could read up more on the accuracy of this method. Sure. Um, yes. So there was uh, a paper in Matter. I can... I, I don't know about the accuracy of the method, right? Because um, it, it, by accuracy, I'm, I'm assuming what you're referring to is a confusion matrix of true positive, um, true negative, and then false positive, false negative, the off diagonals. And and I I don't I don't know how you would do that because you would have to you you would have to know which materials in materials project were not I mean were, were reported but not yet present in the ICSD. So let me let me preface this by saying there, there's a lot of gray matter out there. And what I mean by that is um, ICSD and Cambridge Structure Database are gold standards for a material being agreed upon. Okay, somebody has made this. But then you have all these papers from the 1960s and 70s from the Ural Mountains in, 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 in Russia where, where somebody made a compound and reported it. But it's not I mean, they, they were good scientists, they were careful researchers, but they didn't have the same degree of rigor that, that one would expect to enter the ICSD, or at least the raw data wasn't available. And so these get reported in other materials databases, which I can, I can forward to you. And the number there is a much larger than what's in, in ICSD. So I think the only way that you could possibly solve the confusion matrix, not knowing whether or not the compounds and materials projects have true positive or true negative would be to use that third database as a clue, right? Um, that the so-called gray matter, it's not ICSD quality. It's 
definitely not proven that you can't make it, but it's somewhere in between. Um, somebody reported it in the literature. There's a chance it might be made, um, but it, but it's a, it's a good question. Uh, you can you can see how we used the the tool in our our matter paper. I believe it was published. Um, let me get it out for you. And uh, um, matter. I'll pull it up in a second. In 2022. Um, so I'll flash in the screen briefly. Uh, this paper here is the one that you can see how we used it, how you would check it, um, and and show that it it actually worked um, retroactively, I think you would you would do something like I just described. And then the proof is in the pudding. If we're able to use it to make new materials moving forward, then um, uh, then it would be um, uh, a useful tool or, or agreed upon that it's a useful tool. That's a really hard question. It, it involves um, knowledge that is not yet available to us, whether or not materials and materials project can be made, the ones that are ICSD negative. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think we do have to move on. So Christian, if you wanna come come up and, and set up. So let's thank, uh, thank Tony again for joining us from afar. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay, thanks a lot, Tony. Okay, so now we come to a, a contributor talk and then we have one more invite.